Hi everyone, I am Dr. Deepthi and today I will be discussing the OBS and GYNE questions of NEET PG 2022. Yes, so we had lots of questions from OBS and GYNE and let's look at the first question. So this is a patient who is a case of preeclampsia and uh, she is being given Maxal uh, infusion most likely for profile access, right? And she's also a case of type 1 diabetes and currently her sugars are 280. So now let's look at the symptoms of the patient. The patient is drowsy, respiratory rate is reduced, there is oliguria and the patellar reflex is absent. So what is the cause of drowsiness? So we will say that this is maxal toxicity. Now why would we say that this is toxicity? Because we have to remember that what is the first sign of magnesium toxicity? It is absent DTRs, right? So absent patellar reflex is uh, the first sign of magnesium toxicity, it can happen, you know, through a range of 7 to 10 milli equivalents. But yes, the single best answer at which we say it is completely absent is 10 milli equivalents. At the same time, the patient may experience what? The patient may experience diaphoresis, the patient may experience flushing and slurring of speech. Yes. And at what milli equivalents do you see uh, respiratory paralysis? Yes. So uh, a reduction in the respiratory rate or respiratory paralysis is what we would see at around 12 milli equivalents. So at this, the respiratory paralysis is there. And at what level do you see cardiac conduction defects? So at 15 milli equivalents, there will be cardiac conduction defects. Yes, so uh, this is what is going to be the answer here. Now, what I want you to understand is why is it not eclampsia? Because this is not how eclampsia presents. Eclampsia, you all know, will present as tonic-clonic seizures. Yes, so eclampsia, mein, there are tonic-clonic seizures and there is no such uh, activity written. Right? Why is it not diabetic ketoacidosis? Because you know, uh, for diabetic ketoacidosis, the sugar levels are going to be much higher. So generally, you know, you say the, uh, DKA would happen somewhere when the levels are beyond, uh, you know, uh, 350 or between 350 to 500. Or us may be, when do the neurological symptoms happen? Somewhere around 320 to 330. Yes, also in diabetic ketoacidosis, there is hyperventilation. Yes, Kusmol's breathing. So there is hyperventilation. So this is not uh, the classical clinical presentation of ketoacidosis, right? So the answer is going to be maxal toxicity. And uh, remember, when we talk about maxal toxicity, what is the antidote? Yes, the antidote is going to be 10 ml of 10% IV calcium gluconate. Yes. So we should all know that in the periphery, it is going to block the calcium channels, whereas in the brain, it is going to act on the NDM, uh, NMDA receptors. Yes, so it stabilizes the membrane potential in the brain. It also reduces barotrauma on the brain by causing what? Cerebral vasodilatation. Yes, so here the answer is going to be MagSelf. Toxicity. Let's look at the next question. Again, something that we have always, always done in the classes, right? So, patient with normal blood pressure, uh, normal coagulation profile, but let's look at this. Her ALT, AST is 75 international units, uh, LDH is 400 and the platelet count is 75,000. So, hopefully we have the correct recall here. So, this is going to be HELP syndrome. Yes, so do you remember the tennis criteria? So if we look at the tennis classification, what do we need for diagnosis of help? We need H for hemolysis. So the first requirement is hemolysis. But how do we know whether the patient is having hemolysis or not? So we say we need any two of the following. Yes, so we need any two of the following. And what could that be? How do we get to know about hemolysis? So number one, it could be serum bilirubin more than or equal to 1.2 milligrams per deciliter. If you look at the peripheral smear, you will see what? You will see uh, schistocytes or bar cells. Yes. What is the third? The third is 
haptoglobin which should be less than 25 yes so haptoglobin levels less than 25 mg per deciliter or isi mein hamara kya jata hai ldh yes so ldh more than or equal to two times the normal value and fourth is what severe anemia which is not explained by blood loss so to say that your patient has hemolysis we need any two of the following okay then the second requirement is el right so what is el el is elevated liver enzyme so you all know when we talk about elevated liver enzymes what do we need so we can look at alt or ast hai na so we can look at alt or ast and they should be more than again what more than or equal to two times the upper limit of normal yes so more than or equal to two times the upper limit of normal the third is lp lp stands for low platelet count and what is the requirement here the platelet count should be less than 1 lakh it can be anything but it has to be less than 1 lakh so for making a diagnosis of help syndrome we need all abc we need hemolysis we need elevated liver enzymes and we need low platelet count very very important and something that i always highlight in my class is that high blood pressure is not a requirement to make a diagnosis of help syndrome please remember in up to 15% of patients with help syndrome the blood pressure may be normal so although majority of times the blood pressure will be in the higher side but in 15% patients the blood pressure may be normal yes then you all know that uh, in order to make a diagnosis of cholestasis what do you need uh, you would actually need serum level of bile acids so there is no doubt that bilirubin can be raised in cholestasis as well as liver enzymes can be deranged but the only diagnostic criteria is serum bile acids also when you talk about platelet count they are going to be normal in cholestasis there is no reason why platelet count should be reduced or ldh should be raised so cholestasis is out what about aflp so again something that i have highlighted always when we talk about aflp please ensure that you will make a diagnosis of aflp when you see features of acute liver failure right for example if you have evidence of what yes so if you have evidence of encephalopathy right or they may give you high ammonia levels or they may give you low glucose levels also as compared to um, you know um, help syndrome coagulation abnormalities are much more common in acute fatty liver so in help coagulation is normal but the platelet count is low right so that is why aflp is also not the diagnosis and similarly we all know in acute viral hepatitis um, the liver enzymes are going to be in thousands bilirubin levels are usually going to be beyond 15 yes so uh, which is not the case here and also again in acute hepatitis there is uh, no reason why the platelet count should be lower or ldh should be higher so we will say that the diagnosis here is help syndrome okay let's look at the third question the third question says a patient comes with normal menstrual cycles and now she presents with delayed menses for two weeks so which means she is having a period of amenorrhea but along with amenorrhea she has bleeding and pain so the moment we talk about this a patient who has amenorrhea who comes to us with bleeding and pain what are the probable things that come to your mind yes so this could be a uh, an abortion process which means the pregnancy is intrauterine it could also be an ectopic pregnancy and it could also be a molar pregnancy right so these are the three things that come to our mind immediately now let us look at the further details her hcg value is 1400 and uh, blood pressure is normal ultrasound shows a trilaminar appearance adnexa is normal what is the next step right so since uh, you know um, 
we are not able to see any characteristic findings of molar pregnancy and what is the characteristic finding snowstorm appearance yes so we can see a snowstorm appearance when we talk about molar so currently i am going to say that this is not likely to be a molar pregnancy also the blood pressure is normal so i hope you remember that we said in molar pregnancy there is a tendency to develop what early onset preeclampsia which means even before 20 weeks although she is too soon in early in her pregnancy so now we have a doubt still between abortion and ectopic yes so because we are not able to clearly see anything on ultrasound now let's look at at the hcg values do you remember the discriminatory score of hcg yes so the discriminatory score uh, which we usually tell you is 2000 international units although some of the newer guidelines are actually saying it should be 3500 international units so it's still going up to give the benefit of doubt to the intrauterine pregnancy right so here the if you look at this the hcg value of the patient is less than the discriminatory score and we have no evidence of intrauterine pregnancy as well as extrauterine pregnancy which means probably we are talking about a pregnancy of unknown location so what should we do in this case so when the hcg value is less than the discriminatory score what should you do you have to repeat hcg after 48 hours yes so we are going to repeat hcg after 48 hours to see what is happening to the hcg yes so if the hcg is going to show a doubling effect yes so if it shows a doubling effect then we know that it is a live intrauterine pregnancy yes if it shows a fall it is very likely going to be a abortion whereas if the value plateaus yes then it is more likely to be a ectopic so we will keep doing serial beta hcg for us uh, every 48 hours till we reach the discriminatory score yes and wh what will you do when you do the reach the discriminatory score yes so you will do a repeat ultrasound at that time so once you cross the discriminatory score we will do a repeat ultrasound to see whether we are now able to see a pregnancy either inside or outside the uterus okay chalo and yes this is the discriminatory score for transvaginal scan for trans abdominal the value is much higher it is 6500 international units yes okay so now let's look at this so this is a image of controlled cord traction yes so and uh, the structure being given traction to got torn and this leads to look at the words being used this leads to excessive vaginal bleeding what should be the most appropriate next step so if the cord gets evulsed because you are giving a traction on the cord and you are giving a counter traction on the fundus yes so if the cord gets evulsed and there is profuse bleeding what do you do so if there is excessive or profuse bleeding you should straight away proceed to manual removal of placenta right because you know this is not atonic bleeding so it's not going to simply respond to oxytocin or your uterine massage here uh, the reason is that the placenta is left inside and there is profuse bleeding so you have to quickly remove the cause of this bleeding which is manual removal of placenta yes and please remember uh when we talk about mrp previously also neat pg has asked a few questions and i have done a special session on manual removal of placenta on the youtube earlier as well so please go through it and you know this is something which you have to know has to be done in the ot uh traditionally it was done under general anesthesia but nowadays people are also doing it under regional anesthesia so you can do it under general or regional anesthesia right and uh, please remember uh, once you have done uh, or once you are planning manual removal of placenta you have to give antibiotic cover to the patient you have to give a broad spectrum antibiotic also there is no role bacha okay so there is no role of routine curettage after mrp 
Yes. So there is no role of routine curettage after MRP. And remember that MRP also becomes a risk factor for PPH in the next pregnancy. So whenever you do a manual removal of placenta, you have to know that this is one of the risk factors for developing postpartum hemorrhage. Even in the next pregnancy. And another important complication that can ha uh, happen is endometritis, right? Because you're putting your hand inside the uterus. So another important thing or complication that can happen with manual removal of placenta is endometritis. And that is why I said that you have to give a broad spectrum coverage with antibiotic. Okay. Okay. So let's look at this question now. Again, something that we have routinely done in our classes. So we have done this with a lot of visuals and, uh, you know, images. So when we talk about uh, the pelvis, we all know there is a true pelvis, there is a false pelvis. And the true pelvis is divided into an inlet, a cavity and an outlet. Yes, the cavity is also what we call as mid pelvis. And when we talk about outlet, there is an anatomical outlet and there is an obstetrical outlet. Yes. So inlet, I think kisi ko koi confusion nahi hota hai. Inlet starts from the symphysis pubis, goes all along the iliopectineal lines and goes to the sacral promontory. Yes. So that is what is the inlet. And I am sure you can see here that the image does not represent the inlet. It's not going from the symphysis pubis to the sacral promontory. Okay. Then let's talk about the outlets. So whenever you talk about outlet, whether it is the anatomical outlet or it is the obstetrical outlet, what is going to be the posterior boundary? Batao. The posterior boundary is going to be coccyx. Yes. So in anatomical outlet, the posterior boundary is actually the tip of coccyx. Yes, whereas in the obstetrical outlet, it's the end of sacrum or the body of the coccyx, right, which is going to be the posterior boundary. So if you see very clearly in this image, do you see that they had actually shown the green zone? So ye green zone unhone dikhaya tha, usme ye likha nahi tha, but yes, this is the zone they had shown. Yes, so if you see, it is nowhere near the coccyx, not towards the end of the sacrum, not towards the tip of the coccyx, so this is, does not represent the outlet. Yes, neither the obstetrical outlet nor the anatomical outlet. So, kya bacha hamare paas? Mid pelvis. Now, so the answer is actually mid pelvis. And also when we talk about mid pelvis, you have to know that mid pelvis corresponds to what bacha? Mid pelvis will correspond to the plane of greatest pelvic dimensions or when you talk about greatest pelvic dimensions, it is along the S2 and S3 vertebra, right? So S2, S3 vertebra ke level pe. Uh, greatest pelvic dimensions hote hai. Now let's not confuse this with least pelvic dimensions because you know har cheez ka ek boundary hota hai. So when you talk about the mid pelvis hai na? So when you talk about the mid pelvis iska ek roof hota hai aur uska ek uh, floor hoga right? Or the upper boundary and the lower boundary. So please remember when you talk about mid pelvis okay the floor or the lower boundary of the mid pelvis is the plane of least pelvic dimensions which passes through the ischial spines bacha right so the least pelvic dimensions passes through the level of the ischial spines this forms the floor of the mid pelvis okay ab dhyan se sunoge the floor of actually the mid pelvis is the roof of obstetrical outlet. Bilkul confuse nahi hona hai aur dhyan se sunna. These are planes. So if, if, it's a, if it's a plane, it has an upper boundary, it has a lower boundary. Okay? So please remember this. Uh, the least pelvic dimensions or the plane of least pelvic dimensions forms the roof of obstetrical outlet. Okay? What will be the floor of obstetrical outlet? Anatomical outlet. Okay? So the floor of Obstetrical outlet is the anatomical outlet. And now, what is the difference between 
what is anatomical outlet and what is obstetrical outlet. So when you talk about anatomical outlet na bache, wo kahan se pass karta hai? As I said, this will pass from the lower or the tip of coccyx, right? So posteriorly it is the tip of coccyx. It is the sacrotuberous ligaments. It is the ischial tuberosities in the lower border of symphysis pubis. Yes. So I'm going to repeat. Anatomical outlet, humne kya bola? It is yes. So lower border of symphysis pubis. Ye anterior a gaya. ठीक है. फिर क्या आता है? Ischial tuberosities. Or you can even see the ischiopubic rami. So ischial tuberosities. है ना? Then it is going to be the sacrotuberous ligaments. और एकदम पीछे क्या आएगा? Yes, it is going to be as I said the tip of coccyx. और obstetrical outlet कहाँ से pass कर रहा है? Again, listen to me carefully. Lower border of symphysis pubis, but now laterally to the ischial spines. Yes, so that's the difference. So it passes through the ischial spines and it goes to the lower end of sacrum or Posteriorly kya aega? Coccyx. Not the tip, it's actually the body of the coccyx. Right? So now I hope it is clear. But I told you the easier way to do this question. The easiest way is that the zone they have shown is nowhere close to the coccyx. If it's nowhere close to the coccyx, it's not going to be the outlet. Neither the obstetrical outlet nor the anatomical outlet. Okay? Chalo, aage badte hai. Okay, so this is one place where I hope you have done it right. So let's do this. At what level is the uterus felt on the second day uh, of post delivery? Now, please, bacha, be very careful when uh, when I am going to tell you this. So you have to understand this. When we say, uh, you know, uh, the uterus starts involuting, you have to understand it starts involuting only after 24 hours. Right? In fact, 12 hours there, the fundal height increases a little. Okay? So, you have to know this, that after 24 hours, it is going to be one finger breadth below umbilicus. Okay? Because it is going to involute about one centimeter per day. But that happens after 24 hours. So, which means on the second day, okay, so on the second day postpartum, it is actually going to be one finger breadth below umbilicus, not two finger, right? Wo hota hai after 48 hours, okay, after two days, the question was on the second day post delivery, right? So after 48 hours postpartum, it is going to be two finger breadth below umbilicus and that's how it goes so uh, please remember at the end of seven days it's nearly uh, you know um, or let's forget seven days remember by two weeks it is a vapus going to be a pelvic organ right so it is a pelvic organ by two weeks okay so we say 10 to 12 days it becomes a pelvic organ and complete involution, as we all know, would take around six weeks. Okay? Okay. In embryological development, what causes release of testosterone from the testes? So, again, directly from your class notes, what is the first stimulus? Okay. So, what is the first stimulus for release of testosterone from the fetal testes? So, it is not LH or FSH or GnRH because the hypothalamic pituitary axis becomes active only at 12 weeks, whereas sexual differentiation can happen even at 8 weeks. Yes, the development of uh, testes, the development of ovary. Yes, so by 8 weeks, this is going to happen. And by 8 weeks itself, the testes starts releasing the testosterone. Yes, so by 8 weeks testes or the fetal testes would start releasing testosterone. So, this definitely cannot be because of the hypothalamus or the HP axis or the LH or the FSH. Yes. So, this is because of HCG from the placenta. So, it's actually the first stimulus and this testosterone will now take part in um, 
yes development of external genitalia so it will convert external genitalia and internal genitalia into male like structure so testosterone will act on the wolfian duct to convert it into yes male internal genitalia and i have taught you that internal genitalia can be differentiated into male and female by 10 weeks then this testosterone will be converted into dihydrotestosterone yes by 5 alpha reductase which will then make male external genitalia yes and by 12 to 14 weeks the external genitalia can be identified as male or female okay now let's look at the next question your patient is a multi gravida she is in the second stage of labor which means the cervix is yes fully dilated right so when you say second stage it is a fully dilated cervix right now uh, she has been in the second stage for more than 2 hours yes which means we are talking about what arrest so you all i hope remember a rest of second stage is no descent in a primary gravida for 3 hours and no descent in a multi gravida for 2 hours so we are talking about a rest now let us see what is the cause of this arrest so if you look at this the head is still at the level of the ischial spines so it's not going to rotate so it is an rot yes so rotation nahi ho raha hai now what else is given molding 2 plus caput 2 plus so i hope you remember when we see a rest of labor along with molding and caput what does it tell you it tells you that there is a cephalo pelvic disproportion yes so you are dealing with a case of cpd so once it is cpd you cannot put instruments so vacuum and forceps are out since it's already a rest there is no point to wait and watch any further so what are you going to do you're going to do a emergency cesarean section okay chalo let's go on to the next one okay your patient is d2p1l1 she has a previous classical cesarean now currently she is 35 weeks pregnant and she is in the the baby is in breech what should be your next step yes now um, understand this that once your question says that patient is a case of classical cesarean this patient cannot undergo a vaginal delivery so vaginal delivery is contraindicated with classical cesarean so irrespective of the presentation of the baby whether it is breech or transverse or cephalic this patient has to undergo a planned repeat or elective so planned ka matlab hai elective cesarean section yes so you will post her for a cesarean section at 37 weeks okay now what about ecv so please remember ecv is contraindicated in classical cesarean ipv is also contraindicated in classical cesarean so classical cesarean mein we are not going to try for any versions because it will lead to rupture uterus theek that was a simple one i i hope because this is these are the basic terms we stress upon in the class quite a lot of times hai na chalo so now the secondary wave of trophoblastic invasion wo kab hota hai aapko yaad hai secondary wave hota hai between 12 to 16 weeks the first phase of trophoblastic invasion is completed by 12 weeks the second phase or the secondary wave happens between 12 to 16 weeks theek hai hota kya hai isme so this is what we have taught you in pre eclampsia and i hope uh, you would appreciate that we always do the pathophysiology in quite a detail in the class hai na so vascular remodeling and i always tell you that these are the certain points which are definitely going to be asked as mcqs you remember pehla question kya hota hai 
who is doing the vascular remodeling so the vascular remodeling is done by extra villous cytotrophoblast yes so they are not villous and they are not syncytiotrophoblast so the options which are containing villous or the options which are containing uh, syncytio are all wrong options okay kiski remodeling hoti hai they do remodeling of the spiral arterioles right so the spiral arteries in the decidua are the ones which are going to be the uh, invaded now are they going to be invaded by which type of extra villous cytotrophoblast kyunki do tarah ke hote hain yaad hai they are yes interstitial and endovascular so kaun karta hai endovascular yes so it is the endovascular type of cells which will do the vascular remodeling who is regulating the remodeling decidual natural killer cells so it's an immune mediated process yes and kaun se phases mein do phases 12 weeks 16 weeks so the answer here is d theek hai chalo okay so this one was an easy one which type of hymen is shown it's definitely not annular annular ka matlab hota hai circular it's not imperforated because we are seeing the perforations so it is septate or a called uh, septum because there are two openings and there is a thin membrane between the two so it's septate uh, cribri from be please aap log sab yaad rakhiyega uh cribri from hota hai when there are multiple small openings okay so if the hymen has multiple small openings it's called as cribri from hymen and what is micro perforate micro perforate may be there is a small opening in fact we say it's a very small opening but there's only one opening not multiple openings so in cribri from there are multiple small openings okay so that is micro perforate theek hai chalo aage badhe okay so this is definitely a question which maybe creates confusions uh but let's sort it uh, here okay so your patient is 18 months postpartum and i think i'm quite sure that 18 months was given in the uh, in the uh, question so she is 18 months postpartum she is breastfeeding and she is having what she is having heavy and irregular bleeding right so usko kya contraception dena hai so i am sure we all know it's not copity yes because copity is not going to be given to someone who has heavy bleeding okay it's a relative contraindication now we are left with three options now just me say i'm going to actually remove progesta cert progesta cert is no longer available it is banned it was banned in the year 2001 because of a very very high risk of ectopic pregnancy yes so we are not definitely going to give her progesta cert because it's not available you can't prescribe a drug which is banned and not available theek now nor ethisterone enanthate is a progesterone only uh injectable contraception and this injection works for a span of 2 months but you know what is one of the major problems with uh, this injection and uh, is a reason for a lot of women to discontinue it it is irregular bleeding so this injection itself causes irregular bleeding yes so although it can be given to women who are breastfeeding uh they are safe but still uh, it is not going to solve her problem of heavy irregular bleeding okay so yes the answer is actually mala n now let me explain i know what you think you think ki ma'am we can't give uh, mala n or ocps to be very precise to someone who is breastfeeding so please remember this is a half or a partially correct statement mala n or ocps should not be given as contraceptives in the first 6 months okay and the reason here is not safety to the baby it is safe for the baby but the reason is that ocps can reduce the quantity of milk production yes so they can reduce the quantity of milk production so now imagine the woman is already 18 months into breastfeeding okay uh, anyway this is the time where she the the child or the baby is going to take you know uh, uh, artificial feeds now and is going to be supplemented by other feed 
right so now our concern is not uh, primarily a reduction in the quantity of breast milk but the drug of choice for irregular and heavy bleeding is actually ocps right so when when her concern is irregular and heavy bleeding we must prescribe out of these the best option definitely is going to be oral contraceptive pills it's not contraindicated uh, it should only be avoided in the first 6 months of breastfeeding okay right so which site of implantation will cause severe so look at the words they are using severe vaginal bleeding okay so now it should not be answered as abdominal pregnancy or ovarian pregnancy because both these are more likely to cause severe yes intra abdominal bleeding okay hemoperitoneum they don't cause severe vaginal bleeding in fact the vaginal bleeding in an abdominal pregnancy or an ovarian pregnancy is going to be very slight which is only because of decidual reaction so when the implantation is on the internal os that is when it can cause severe vaginal bleeding okay all right so again something from our class notes and something that we reinforce upon when we teach so copper tea is contraindicated in so is it contraindicated immediate delivery no in fact we know about post placental uh, intrauterine device which means you're giving it within 10 minutes hai na so post placental hota hai when you are inserting copper tea within 10 minutes so it's definitely not contraindicated is it contraindicated in ruptured condom no in fact it is one of the most effective emergency contraceptive hai na bar bar padhate hain hum so it is the most effective emergency contraceptive is it contraindicated in menstruation no it's not contraindicated in menstruation at all uh it's just that you know in fact uh, towards the end of menstruation we say you can actually preferably put it because the os is slightly open yes not when the patient is heavily bleeding not on the day 1 but something like day 5 when the bleeding has greatly reduced and the os is slightly open it's actually easier to introduce the copper tea device so it's not contraindicated in menstruation as well and this is post molar trophoblastic disease because you know we have taught you that copper tea will cause or can cause heavy bleeding and when this is going to happen what is the problem you might think that patient has converted into neoplasia also uh, there could be a slightly higher chance of perforation as well so it should not be given after evacuation of trophoblastic disease uh, the preferred contraceptives uh, after molar evacuation we've told you is yes ocps okay chalo again something i don't want to say it but i'll still say it directly from the class notes but yes so she is a 22 year old female who presents with infertility and for her evaluation you are doing an hsd this is exactly how i teach you that mullerian anomalies are actually incidental findings on hsg yes you are doing it for infertility and then you find it please understand it does not mean that the anomaly itself is causing infertility no mullerian anomalies don't actually cause infertility they are incidental findings in patients with infertility right now if you look at this picture uh, the angle between the two horns definitely looks a uh, acute angle yes so the angle between the two horns looks like an acute angle so is it's this is more likely to be a septate uterus obviously hsg is not a modality to confirmatorily say whether it is septate or biconvoate but it is more likely going to be septate so you all know that in biconvoate the horns are more far apart yes the angle is more than 60 degrees and the distance between the two horns will also be more wide in biconvoate more than 4 cm so this is more likely going to be septate theek what is the ioc 3d ultrasound yes the investigation of choice for mullerian anomalies is a 3d ultrasound gold standard is mri and the best is laparohistoscopy yes okay 
So this question says an absolute contraindication for cervical circlage in a patient with a cervix of 1.8. So we all know that if it is less than 2 centimeters, we say it is incompetent cervix or a short cervix, uh, which has a high probability of aborting of preterm labor. Yes. So what are the contraindications? This is again a very simple uh, direct MCQ. It is ruptured membrane. So ruptured membrane is an absolute contraindication okay when the membranes are prolapsing into the vagina can you still do it yes so if you remember i have taught you about emergency cerclage or a rescue cerclage yes so this is when the cervix is fully dilated the membranes are prolapsing into the uh, vagina but they're not yet ruptured but once they are ruptured it becomes an absolute contraindication okay Okay. Recommendation for surgery after VVF. All right. I think I don't know. Ye kyu unhone ye wala question diya hai. Maybe they were just uh, baki sab unhone pooch dala. So they came to this. So now, um, so best answer here is uh, that pregnancy should definitely be avoided for a span of one year. So pregnancy avoided for one year. हमारे पास दो options हैं. Uh, yeah, though, yes, so it has to be either of these two. So two years and six years is not a recommendation. Now, as far as abstinence go goes, uh, please remember the minimum requirement for abstinence is actually three months. So that is why I'm going to go with option B. That is abstinence for three months and avoid pregnancy for a span of one year. So minimum requirement for abstinence is three months. It can go up to six months also. But six months is not mandatory. It's not the minimum requirement. Isle three months becomes a better option. Manlo, if this is not a correct recall or they repeat again, and if three months is not in the options, then you can definitely go with six months. But from the recall that I got from the students, there was a separate option of three months and that is what we are going to go with because that is the minimum requirement for abstinence after a VVF repair. Okay. Now, uterine artery Doppler at 12 to 14 weeks. So, you, you all know about uterine artery Doppler in the second trimester and we all know that this is what is used for prediction of preeclampsia. What about uterine artery Doppler at 12 to 14 weeks or in the first trimester? So when you are doing a first trimester scan between 11 to 14 weeks, at that time if your patient is high risk, then we can do a uterine artery Doppler as well. And this is basically done to pick up specially early onset preeclampsia. So in high risk women, it is a, it has a good predictive value for early onset preeclampsia. Now some of you must be wondering ki isme kya dekhte hai. So what we see is again the same thing. We look for two things. We look for pathological PI, pulsatility index. Okay, so wo bad jata hai. And <clears throat> we look for early diastolic notch. It's not one of these things. Usually both of these things is what is having a good predictive value for early onset preeclampsia, right? So, uh, and the concept behind this is, again, going back to vascular remodeling, you all remember that the first phase of vascular remodeling, kab khatam ho tha? Hanji. So, the first phase of vascular remodeling is going to happen or finish by 12 weeks. Iska matlab 12 weeks pe PI should reduce a little. Notching should reduce a little. Aapko ye yaad hona chahiye. We have taught you that as pregnancy advances, the pulsatility index decreases, then notching will also gradually disappear. Yes? Magar agar vascular remodeling nahi hua If there is no vascular remodeling, the spiral arteries are still tortuous. So instead of the PI falling, it keeps rising. So if you see... Uh, a, a non, you know, a non-significant fall or an increase in PI, which is what we call as pathological PI, along with early diastolic notching, together they have a good predictive value for early onset preeclampsia. Okay. Okay. Then, 
After seven weeks of MTP, what are the drugs we use? Very easy. This is also a question that we gave in the NEET PG mock, right? The mock we did just before the exam. We had the same question there. Usme to many drug ke doses bhi dale the, but in the NEET PG exam, they gave the same question without the drug dose. So you all know if it is uh, seven weeks or if it is the first trimester, you can do medical termination. And you know, uh, this medical termination can be done inpatient or outpatient. Hai na? So, farak kya hai? Inpatient, uh, outpatient is done up to 7 weeks. So, up to 7 weeks, you can do an outpatient medical abortion. Whereas, uh, beyond 7 weeks, you will do an inpatient abortion. Yes? Or is maybe uh, up to 7 weeks, we use Mifi and Misoprostol. This is 200 milligrams. This is 400 micrograms. The gap between the two is 48 hours. Both are. So, this is definitely oral. Misoprostol can be oral. It can be sublingual. It can be buccal. It can also be vaginal. The dose remains the same. Okay. Okay. Inpatient. If your patient is beyond 7 weeks and up to, you know, 12 weeks, what are we going to do? I'm talking about first trimester abortion, okay? So, that is why I'm restricting myself to 12 weeks. So, beyond 7 weeks, if she is between 7 to 9, you can again do medical abortion, which means you will again use Mifi and Mizo. Mifi ka dose is again 200 milligrams oral, but Mizo now becomes 800 micrograms. It can be sublingual, buccal, oral, vaginal. Okay? And beyond 9 weeks, up to 12, what we prefer is suction and evacuation. Right? So, this is what you need to know. So, methotrexate, although WHO approved, in India may nahi hai approved. So, we are using Mifi, Pristone and Misoprostol. Okay? All right. So, this seems like an old repeat question. So, you all know that the correct answer is actually 300 uh, kilocals, which is an extra calorie requirement throughout pregnancy. Um, you know, 350 is what is the precise answer. But this seems to be based on a previous MCQ or the previous guidelines where it was 300 kilocals in all the trimesters. Right? So, I'm just going to go with 300 kilocals in all trimesters. The answer is not 400. Okay, so please remember in the second and third trimester, the limit is actually 340 to 350. So, American guidelines say around 340. Our national guidelines say 350. And this is early 12 weeks. Hai. So, if it's early, uh, early second trimester, hai, it's just beginning. It's not going to be 400 kilocal. So, 400 is not the answer. The answer will remain as 300 in all trimesters. Okay. Okay. After five days of vaginal delivery, a woman is brought to the casualty. I'm not sure. Yes, okay. Uh, after five days, with the history of crying, loss of appetite, hai na? Or kya ho raha usko? Difficulty in sleeping, feeling low, classical symptoms of mild depressive illness, hai na? So, symptoms of mild depressive illness like sadness, crying, anxiety, insomnia, exhaustion, yes, developing in the first week, especially in the first two to three days. So, developing in the first week after delivery, yes, mild depressive symptoms is what is this? Yes, so this is a classical case of postpartum blues. So, we need 3 to 4 symptoms to say there are no absolute criteria, but yes, 3 to 4 symptoms would we would say that these are postpartum blues. They are quite common. So, nearly 40% of postpartum women will experience the postpartum blues. Uh, they will actually resolve within 2 weeks. Yes, so they resolve within 2 weeks. And uh, the reason is, uh, you know, uh, very likely to be hormonal. So, a sudden fall of both the uh, sex hormones, estrogen and progesterone, right? So, fall of E and P, 
is one of the mechanisms for postpartum blues and we don't do anything actively so watchful waiting okay is what we do for postpartum blues okay all right chalo so a primary gravida is brought by her relatives after one hour of a full term delivery the baby is doing well and on examination she is hypotensive and hypoxic and she has dic so she represents a case of cardiac failure hai na and she has dic right but she is not a known case of any cardiac condition what is the likely cause so this is very likely to be what yes so this is very likely to be amniotic fluid embolism now let's see why not peripartum cardiomyopathy so wo isliye nahi main bolungi because in peripartum cardiomyopathy yes there is cardiac failure but there is no dic in peripartum cardiomyopathy whereas amniotic fluid embolism is what will present suddenly with hypoxia uh, hypotension yes even coma and then seizures so that can also happen inversion nahi ho sakta because inversion mein you would see the uterus outside uh, so uh, the best answer here is amniotic fluid embolism remember the first phase of afe the patient will develop a sudden onset of breathlessness uh, she will quickly develop hypotension she will quickly go into coma uh, and most women do not survive this first phase of amniotic fluid embolism and that's when they actually enter the second phase which is characterized by dic okay all right so those were the questions um you know uh, these are the same topics that we have been highlighting in our various tests in the classes exactly in the same format in which we tell you they are likely to be asked so in a nutshell uh, stop reading unusual things read uh, you know common things in depth you have to know the why is the pathophysiology you know details of everything that has high likelihood of being asked so instead of trying to do everything about something okay please do everything about that thing which has high likelihood to be asked in the exam so something about everything nahi everything about something that is likely to be asked theek hai so i hope um, this helps you and if you have any queries we are here um to answer all your all your queries and we'll keep bringing more sessions to you all the best take care 